good friend would. That's true. <laughs> we'll see how good a friend he really is. <laughs> okay. Yep. Yeah, so I'm gonna read a little party announcement before we kick off. Sure. Can we party? Nine o'clock? Tonight? Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. So quick announcement before we begin. Uh, so talking about the party tonight, party starts at 9 p.m. Uh, you're going to want to enter from the terrace level. So that's basically one level up from where we are here. Uh, beer and wine will be complimentary, and the, everyone will get two tickets that will essentially allow you to get a mixed drink. So lots of booze flowing for the party or soft drinks if that's your thing as well. Um, anything top shelf will obviously cost a little more. But be responsible and have fun, obviously. But before we do that, and a few more talks for the evening and hopefully some dinner to you know, help soak up the booze, um, we're going to have uh, Steve Black here who's going to give a quick review on uh, cybersecurity issues in law over the last year. So first time speaker here at ShmooCon, let's give him a round of applause. Well, that was very kind of you and good afternoon. It's four o'clock in the afternoon and you're still sitting here, so either you're wedged in your chair or you have nowhere else to go. So I will try and entertain you at least moderately over the next 20 minutes. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Steve Black. I'm a law professor and also an associate dean at Texas Tech University in Lubbock, Texas. And this is the Cyber Law Year in Review. No, it's not. There we go. All right, to start off with, <clears throat> um, Comey made these announcements in March, and I just thought this is a really good place to start. We all value privacy. We all value security. We should never have to sacrifice one for the other. And so there are my thoughts on how we balance security with privacy, right? And I'm not going to distinguish who's on the one side of the seesaw and who's on the other. So I came up with a list of about seven. It's going to be seven and a half if we have enough time to go through them. So number seven on the cyber law year in review. There we go. This is Alaska. <clears throat> in December, three 20-year-olds pleaded guilty in the District of Alaska to conspiracy to violate the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act uh, in operating the Mirai botnet. In 2016, the three had created the botnet, which targeted hundreds of thousands of IoT devices. So we're talking about wireless cameras, routers, and DVRs. And then they used the botnet to uh, stage a number of DDoS attacks. The defendant's involvement with the botnet ended in 2016 when they published the code. Um, and then on December 8th, two of the three also pleaded guilty uh, to conspiracy to violate the CFA de involving a second click fraud botnet using those same devices. So why Alaska? The special agent in charge said, quote, the FBI Anchorage office investigated this case because many rural Alaska communities and businesses are uniquely vulnerable to cyber crimes due to our reliance on the integrity of internet access. So if you threaten a judge's home router, don't be the fish. I'll wait for everybody to take a look at that. So, <clears throat> Alaska is susceptible to the internet. If you're going to mess with devices that end up in Alaska or threaten their internet, you may be prosecuted by the, uh, by the FBI. All right, number six. This is a 1986 Hyundai Excel. Why in the world is it up there? 1986 is also the same year that the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act was signed into law. I'll let you draw conclusions on which one has held up better over the years. <laughs> okay, there's my, my uh, courtesy laugh. This is Matthew Keyes. Keyes was the former deputy social media editor for the Reuters News Network and was convicted in October 2015 for his role in a conspiracy to hack the LA Times and Tribune Co. websites. He was also the web producer for KTXL Fox 40 in Sacramento. <clears throat> and he provided members of a hacker group login information for the Tribune servers. Okay, the CFAA makes it a crime to get unauthorized access, but, and there's a question of whether or not he had unauthorized access. He had been fired, he still had the login keys, 
So there's a question there. Instead, the CFA also makes it a crime to cause damage, whether or not the access is authorized or not. And the Ninth Circuit last year said this. Prior to the conduct, so here's what the website looked like after the hack. And it said, prior to his conduct, the website existed in a certain state of security. Keys made the website far weaker by taking and creator, creating new user accounts. This manipulation of user accounts impaired the system. What? So it becomes a felony to impair a system. Okay, I throw that out there for those of you who may be, is this vandalism or is this a felony? So just letting you know, the Ninth Circuit is now considering this type of activity um, a crime. All right, number five. Hacker librarians. What? The Copyright Office, every three years, holds proceedings to determine new exemptions to the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, or DMCA. What in the world? Congress identified certain classes of permanent exemptions, such as reverse engineering and security testing, as exceptions to a violation of the Copyright Act. In addition, every three years, the Copyright Office holds a hearing to determine what other catch-all exemptions should be part of the process so that you're not in violation of the Copyright Act. The Cyber Law Clinic at Harvard, in conjunction with the Software Preservation Network, and a coalition of medical device um, patients and researchers filed a request for a new exemption. What type of exemption? They want the ability to subvert copyright protections for software. Why? Because certain types of software is the gateway to certain types of copyrightable materials. Now, what do I have WordStar up here for? Okay, the author of Game of Thrones wrote the entire series on a DOS-based WordStar machine. So the original material is only accessible through WordStar, and guess what? The license has expired. Okay, there are lots of software um, protection mechanisms that, if allowed to exist and we can't subvert them, would mean that all the copyright material that we would like to preserve and archive and study would be, make it a crime. And so the, the Cyber Law Clinic and the Software Preservation Network want to do away with that and have an exemption for that. The medical device community also wanted the ability to hack into things such as pacemakers so that they could have the data from those rather than have to get licenses from manufacturers or other t uh, groups that may or may not be around or may not be uh, amenable to getting licenses so that we can study those types of things. All right, number four. This one you may find interesting. <clears throat> September 26th, last year, the Massachusetts Joint Committee on Consumer Protection held a hearing to hear testimony about two bills on a proposed digital right to repair. The two bills would require manufacturers of digital devices to provide diagnostic, repair, and service information to not only their own licensed techs, but anybody. In addition, manufacturers would have to allow independent techs and owners to purchase replacement parts and service tools at a reasonable price. Now, as this usually happens with legislation, we don't define what a reasonable price is. But in 2012, Massachusetts was the first state to enact a right of repair for autos. And so all those service manuals and all those parts have to be provided to the public and to non-licensed technicians so that they can repair their own cars. And you could draw an inference of why Car Talk was in Massachusetts and Massachusetts has the right of repair. It's a progressive state. It's very interesting. So if you can imagine what this means for the cell phone industry and why Apple is actively opposing all such legislation, in, not only in Massachusetts, but also in Nebraska and other states that are considering these types of things. Being able to have service manuals and the ability to get parts would be huge. Number three. Okay, who? 
High Q v LinkedIn. I know LinkedIn. Who in the world is High Q? No High Q employees in the audience. Wonderful. High Q is a company that provides workforce data and employment analytics. <clears throat> they collect it by scraping it from publicly available LinkedIn profiles. On May 23rd, LinkedIn sent a cease and desist letter. Please stop scraping our website. And then as LinkedIn usually does, also took electronic measures to block any HiQ employees from scraping the data. <clears throat> they went to trial, HiQ sued for access to the data, and the court said this, conferring on private entities such as LinkedIn, the blanket authority to block viewers from accessing information publicly available on its website for any reason, backed by criminal sanctions, could pose an ominous threat to public discourse and the free flow of information. In addition, the court said, merely viewing a website in contravention of a unilateral directive from a private entity and making it a crime would effectuate the digital equivalence of Medusa. And so the judge issued an injunction against LinkedIn and said you have to let them have access to the data. We will be watching that case with more interest in the coming year, and I'm assuming that LinkedIn will continue to appeal. All right, number two. This one's fairly quick. You may have heard of one or more of these companies, but these were some of the big names that had been breached and had paid out settlements in March. So Neiman Marcus paid out a total of 1.6 million to victims of their data breach. Home Depot paid out 25 million. <clears throat> the lesson here is it's only going to get more expensive as the years go on. And that leads us to the number one issue for cyber law in the year. You may have heard of this news story just a little bit. Too much? Should we just skip it? All right, <clears throat> so I have some numbers on the right and some letters too. 50, 145.5, 240, and FTC, CFPB, SEC. Maybe I should make my own game for the, the conference, right? If you can figure these out. Let's go through them. Number one, the 50. All 50 states have commenced investigations of Equifax and the breach. 145.5. That's the latest headcount of victims, 145.5 million potential victims. 240, that's my latest count of class action lawsuits pending. 240, it's going to go up. <clears throat> the FTC, CFPB, SEC, SEC is the Security and Exchange Commission, they're investigating. Consumer Financial Protection Board, yes, and the FTC is the Federal Trade Commission, and then the two flags, England and Canada, are each um, pursuing their investigations as well. All right, here's the takeaway. <clears throat> if a company that you work for gets breached and it's big enough, then what will happen? Congress and state legislators will start trying to come up with ways that this shouldn't have happened. So there are pending bills to do the following. Number one, allowing customers to freeze their credit. Currently, you can freeze your credit, but it costs you a fee. They're considering making it legal to charge a fee for that. Number two, <clears throat> right now it's legal for your employers to conduct a credit search on you. That will not happen anymore if that bill passes, or it will in certain limited cases of employers. So employers that need to have that information, for example, if you work for a bank. Number three, the burden of proof for credit reporting errors will switch, meaning you don't have to prove that it was an error. The credit reporting agencies will now have to fix that if you alert them to it. Altogether, I've called these crowd fixing, and it's bad. So if you work for a company, you do not want to be crowd fixed. Right? That's where somebody else decides everything that's wrong with your business and decides to fix it. It's expensive, and it's going to cause you a lot of grief. <clears throat> All right, I had seven items, and I decided to keep going with Equifax, so this is number 0.5, if we can do that numbering scheme. What else is going on? 
<clears throat> the legislation, or excuse me, the litigation that's going to happen mostly alleges negligence. At the law, negligence is a cause of action that has four elements. Here's what you have to prove. Number one, you have to prove that there was a duty. Number two, you have to show that there was a breach of that duty. Number three, you have to show that the breach was the cause of, number four, damage. And that's where we're going to go. Massachusetts is led off with the litigation against Equifax. And in the Massachusetts complaint, here are some of the duties that they mentioned. Number one, industry warnings. If the industry says that there's a problem out there, we have to pay attention to it. Otherwise, you can be held liable. So when we get together like this and we start talking about problems, we need to fix those. Otherwise, the lawyers are, may hold us liable. Number two, you know those promises that you make in the terms of service on your website? Guess what? The Massachusetts Attorney General went and read those for Equifax and then said, you didn't keep your promises. So you might want to just go take a look at the terms of service and your T's and C's and make sure that anything you promise customers, you are giving to them. Number three, if there's a state law saying that you have to do something, we ought to pay attention to that. Number four, if you find out there is a breach, let people know early. Don't wait. Number five, <clears throat> if you knew about it or should have known about it, and that one's the most troubling, how should I have known about a breach? So you need to know who's in your system and how long they've been in your system and take proactive steps. All right. Fourth cause, which is damages, is not where we want to go right now. <clears throat> On August 15th of last year, CareFirst, which is an insurer, um, filed for the Supreme Court to take up their case. In June of 2014, an unknown hacker gained access to their system, stole names, birth dates, personal information for about 1.1 million policyholders. They went to trial, care first lost, and then they were overturned. Their attorney argued, yes, we were breached, but the victims have not shown that they were damaged. We know that their information was stolen, but not one of them came forward and said, this is how much money I lost. So here's a map of how we divide up the federal courts of appeals. <clears throat> and currently, the second, third, fourth, and eighth circuits have held that unless you can show actual damages, you don't have a case. However, turn the page, maybe turn the page. The sixth, seventh, and ninth circuits hold just the opposite. And so that makes for a good case to go up to the Supreme Court. We may see that this term, we may see it next term. <clears throat> And finally, for bonus, here are some issues that are coming up this next year that we ought to pay attention to. Starting from the left, New York has enacted new financial services regulations dealing with cybersecurity. To the far right, that's the EU, if my geography is correct. We need to pay attention to the GDPR. To the far left, China and many other countries have said, if you're going to store data from our citizens, we'd like the data stored in our country. Well, let's just hold on to that one for just a minute. We'd like the data stored in our country. How much of a problem is that going to cause if we have cross-border data with different citizens? In the middle, that's a honeypot. What? So, coming up... Different states are making it illegal if you take proactive defensive measures. I don't know what a proactive defensive measure, but if you start hacking back the hackers, you may involve your company in liability. And finally, <clears throat> this is the story I'll end on, on the far right at the bottom, the FBI. So in March, the FBI had 100 child pornographers dead to rights. <clears throat> they had enacted a sting using what they call NITs, which are network investigation techniques, except that the defense attorney said, I'd like to see those techniques. And the FBI said, well, we'll explain what we did. And they said, no, 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 we want to see the tools that you used. The FBI then dropped the case rather than disclose what they had. If you or your employer are going to be involved in litigation and you would not like to disclose the tools that you have, 
you may need to consider how you are going to keep those tools private if you end up in court. Okay? That's the cyber law year in review. It's a dangerous world out there. Do good work. I have time for questions. How did he not make the list? Oh my goodness. Yes, that's a great question. There were a lot of items that didn't make the list this year in, in the interest of time. Um, and I went for uh, interest. So it was completely on me if you don't like the, the choice of the list doesn't speak to importance or uh, the legal weight of any of the things that I left off the list. Thank you. We're good. All right. Thank you.